As the Secretary General of the United Nations, an organization of 147 member states who represent almost all of the human inhabitants of the planet Earth, I send greetings on behalf of the people of our planet. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm. Howdy, folks. This is Lou Elizondo, and you are listening to my very good friend, Christina Gomez, on Shifting the Paradigm. This is Ray Sobs from the Unex Network, and you're listening to Shifting the Paradigm with the intrepid Christina Gomez on the X. You're listening to the Unex Network, KUNX DV, Kansas City, Missouri. Welcome to Shifting the Paradigm. I'm Christina Gomez on the Paradigm Shifts channel and on the X, the UnX network, KUNX digital broadcasting talk radio. Are you ready for this? Because we're about to embark on an hour and a half of UFO shenanigans and paranormal adventures. Right here is where we look and think outside the proverbial box. We jump down those rabbit holes where you get a red tic tac instead of a red pill. First off, make sure you subscribe and share these shows on social media to those who you think are having their minds and eyes open to the reality of the UFO mystery. All of these shows are great primers. And in the push for more clarity, transparency, and disclosure, the more voices demanding answers, the better. Well, here we are just four days away from Christmas and 10 days out from 2022. It's been an interesting year. Do you remember how it was for the first few months of the year leading up to the release of the UAP report? Literally, every day, there was mainstream media coverage on the topic. And I mean serious coverage, not being treated as a joke. Well, not so much. I mean, you still had the intros that would play music like from the X-Files or use cheesy graphics. But for the most part, the various journalists and news anchors kept it serious. Those were some amazing months for bringing new public interest to the mystery. The discussion was elevated and you could talk more openly about your interests with people around you. I hope we get that back in the new year because everything went quiet after the report was released and the news cycle went on to other things. Anyways, my guest tonight will be Peter Robbins, who for over the last four decades has researched deeply into the UFO phenomenon with writing magazines and articles internationally, along with being a guest and assisting in TV shows, movies, documentaries, and so much more. From the United Nations, the Sci-Fi Channel, multiple UK and Japanese magazines, public speaking at many UFO conferences, and a member at the Academy of Ufology in France, he truly is a wealth of knowledge. But before we bring in our guest, let's go over some of the more unusual and bizarre news from this last week. 
Police in Ohio said they are on the hunt for an unusual piece of stolen property, an entire 58-foot-long pedestrian bridge, which is about 17.5 meters. The Acorn Police Department said the bridge formerly served as a pedestrian walkway along the Little Cuyahoga River in Middlebury Run Park, but was moved to an open field as part of a wetlands restoration project. Police said the city had planned to repurpose the bridge in a new location, and they recently discovered the $40,000 bridge had been stolen from its temporary home. Investigators said they believe the bridge was disassembled and taken from the field piece by piece. And police said the bridge has little recycling value, so they suspect it was taken by someone who intends to use it. I mean, how does that happen? How do you just walk away with the bridge? What are you going to do with it? In other news, a rare copy of a Superman number one comic book was recently purchased for $2.6 million in an auction. In 1939, it was sold for 10 cents at a newsstand. The comic shows Spider-Man leaping over tall buildings on the cover and was sold Thursday night to a buyer who wishes to maintain a secret identity, according to ComicConnect.com, an online auction and consignment company. The seller, Mark Michelson, bought the comic in 1979 from its original owner and kept it in a temperature-controlled safe. Michelson, now semi-retired and living in Houston, Texas, paid his way through college by buying and selling comics. What an interesting news report. I'm more of a Marvel gal myself, and I like the comics and movies of Spider-Man, and I'm looking forward to watching the newest Spider-Man movie, No Way Home, starring Tom Holland. I think he makes a fun and quirky Spider-Man. We have seen a lot of people portraying Spider-Man over the last decade. Which actor has been your favorite? I personally like Tom, especially with his chemistry with Doctor Strange, played by Benedict Cumberbatch. They have a very fun dynamic and bring comedy with their sarcastic remarks more than just by telling jokes. So it keeps to the seriousness of older superhero movies, but by adding some more lightheartedness compared to the past, at least in, in my opinion. So next in the news, there's going to be an unprecedented mission going to Venus called the Venus Life Finder in 2023. I have the awesome Christopher Plain, head writer for The Debrief, on the phone with me right now. Chris, what can you tell us about this mission? Well, this is a really exciting development, Christina, and the story of Venus. Uh, as a lot of people might have remembered, late last year, there was a detection in the Venusian atmosphere of the chemical phosphine. It's a type of phosphorus gas. And the reason this was a critical, very exciting finding was it was in a particular layer of the atmosphere where the pressures and the temperatures and the radiation had already been determined would be perfect for some sort of microbial life. And on Earth, Phosphine is excreted by certain types of extreme life forms that live in similar environments as those clouds. So there was always this feeling that there might be, even if there was life on the surface of Mars at some point, there might still be some remnants still living in Venus's atmosphere. There, so NASA has planned a couple of their own missions but they're not really going to follow up on that specific signal because other priorities had already been uh, built into those missions. So what's happening now is the private sector is taking it on themselves to follow up on that data and see, is there really life in the Martian, uh, in the Venusian atmosphere? So this newest announcement came from uh, MIT and they've partnered up with a company called Rocket Lab. And Rocket, Rocket Lab is what they sound like. They shoot stuff up into space on rockets, and they provide end-to-end -end services, meaning they'll help you control and develop and all that. 
So in 2023, which is really right around the corner from uh, as far as astronomy missions go, uh, they're going to shoot this uh, a probe up into the atmosphere of Venus. It's going to use a laser, and the laser will shoot out the window of the probe and illuminate the various gases and particles around it in the atmosphere. Now, of course, this won't specifically confirm whether or not there's life there. That's a much more complicated process. But what it will do is confirm the presence of complex, potentially organic molecules. And that's because when they shoot it with the laser, it will either light up or fluoresce, like fluorescence is the term scientists I've learned use, or it won't. If it doesn't light up, it's probably just really simple molecules, and it would mean that that phosphine signal may not be as robust as originally thought. But they're expecting to see that fluorescence, as well as a particular size and shape to the molecules that would indicate that they are organics, possibly phosphine. If that mission is successful, this Venus Life Finder series actually has three missions in total. So that one would go up in 2023. There would be a follow-up mission in 2026. That would be a lot more complex. It would actually have a probe with a balloon so we could hang around and float around that Venus atmosphere for days, weeks, possibly even months, depending on the mission parameters, and gather all kinds of information about the gases up there, including that phosphine signature that was found. Now, here's where things get really exciting. If they find what they're looking for in that second mission, there is a third mission of the tr three proposed, probably around the end of the decade, probably around 2029, that would actually go up, scoop up some of that Venus atmosphere, and bring it back to Earth for analysis. And of course, we know there's a big mission for Mars that they're working on for the end of the decade called the uh, Mars Sample Return Mission. And it's the exact same idea that if we're really looking for chemical signs of life, or if we're really looking for indicators of ancient life like we are on Mars, the best place to do that is here on Earth, where we have the entire suite of instruments, technologies, and analysis tools available to us, as opposed to just the little bits you can pack on a satellite. For instance, this first one, going up in 2023, is only about a kilogram or a little over two pounds in weight. And that's all there is for the little laser and the little sensor package. So that's why this is really exciting. Uh, I reported on the debrief that uh, very recently, the original team that found that phosphine signal in 2020 doubled down on it with some recent analysis and said, not only do we see phosphine there, but we're convinced we're seeing it in the concentrations that couldn't be produced on Venus via any natural process. And they're convinced that the best answer for that phosphine presence is microbiological life. So with this new Venus Life Finder mission in 2023, it's follow up in 2026, and fingers crossed good results uh, end in that third and final mission right around the end of the decade, it might become a race between the people searching Venus and the people searching Mars to bring the first sample back home that can be studied in labs and say, you know what? We found life outside of Earth. And in the Venus case, it may not be ancient life. It may actually be real, currently living microbial life that belches out this phosphine as part of its biological process. Chris, which planet do you suspect life will be discovered upon first, Mars or Venus? So that's the magic question, right? So we really are in a race here. Uh, if it were just NASA, uh, Mars has a tremendous head start. They're working with the European Space Agency on that Mars sample return. And there's an entire number of steps uh, that they plan to go through before they bring that back. For instance, the Perseverance rover has already cached four different samples of Martian soil that they found particularly tantalizing. They felt were really good chances of showing signs of life. They also cached one of the Martian atmosphere just as uh, compare what's in the air there. So 
that one is already in the steps or in the process of bringing that material back to Earth and having it analyzed in the labs. However, there is no concrete evidence for life past or present on Mars. There's great indicators. We found a number of sources of water. We found organics there. We found a number of exciting things that make us think, yeah, there probably was life at some point on Mars. This life on Venus, if it's there, and if it's really in the part of the atmosphere they expected it to be, that would be current living life, non-human, non-Earth, non-terrestrial life, even at the microscopic level, hanging out in Venus's atmosphere doing its thing. So I don't know which one's going to come first, Christina. I know that teams on both sides are racing. I think this private mission uh, that MIT is behind might give Venus a small leg up in the sense of urgency, while Mars has the big uh, infrastructure of the European Space Agency and NASA really chasing those signs there. So I don't know which one's going to come first, and I wouldn't be surprised if they both showed up around the same time and we got great news out of both places. Wow, I think my money will have to be on Mars when it comes to see which planet will show the discovery of life first. With the potential microbial life found on Jezero Crater, that seems more possible than the hypothesis of phosphine being a byproduct on Venus. Thanks so much, Chris. This has been really fascinating. Let me know in the live chat what you think, what your odds are, which planet, in your opinion, will life be discovered on first and why? You know, right now, Mars has the Perseverance rover, while Venus doesn't have anything to that extent yet, not for another year. So Mars has a head start in finding life first. Make sure to check out Chris's articles at the Debrief website where he writes there every day. He covers everything from space, UFOs, and cutting-edge technology. And now, let me bring in my special guest, Peter Robbins. Welcome to Shifting the Paradigm, Peter. How are you today? Very well, Christina. I'm delighted to be on your show with you. Thank you. Peter, you have an extraordinary history digging deep into so many aspects of the UFO topic. For nearly four decades, you have what it seems like you have been hands-on and boots on the ground with your research and coverage. You were even an editorial assistant on the United Nations Secretary General's report for the establishment of a UN UFO department, and also an event coordinator for the Sci-Fi Channel's alien abduction phenomena, along with being a writer in many magazines and also a consultant on many films, TV shows, and documentaries. And beyond your UFO research and coverage, you are an experienced New York City tour guide and also have a dynamic and rich artistic background. That is only to name a few things in your history of being involved in the topic. I mean, honestly, you have a bio that people can only dream of. So I have a lot of young college age viewers and listeners, as well as high schoolers. So a lot of teenagers very new to this topic, you yourself have been interested in the UFO topic since your early teen years. But I'm really curious, as someone not far from my teen years, you had quite an impressionable and somewhat overwhelming sighting when you were 14 years old with your sister. What was that where your fascination started? Like, was that where you gave the proverbial push towards being incredibly involved and hardworking in the topic? Or was it some years later that you became involved? Uh, great question. Um, when my sister and I were kids, uh, relatively speaking, um, we had a profoundly unambiguous UFO sighting. Uh, we were born in New York City. Our folks uh, moved us out to Long Island to a small village about 30 miles east of Manhattan. So we grew up with the best of both worlds, really, uh, the culture and excitement of the city and nature and small town uh, life as well. And on this one particular late spring, early summer morning, we were goofing around on the front lawn as kids do and um, coming in. In a clear blue sky, um, 
were five silvery white disc shaped objects. They were in a precise V, as in Victor, formation. They were obviously metallic. They were close enough that we could make out regular detailing around the edge of each. Uh, and um, when we discussed it many years later for the first time, uh, we both agreed that we could only read that detailing like windows on an airliner at an appreciable distance. And my reaction to it was one of being completely, in every respect, overwhelmed. This was a more innocent time, a more innocent place. I was a, we were very unsophisticated kids. For me, I guess I grew up intuiting the adult message that this phenomena was a fantasy, it wasn't real, except in science fiction movies, which I would regularly enjoy. Uh, often on a Saturday with some of my geeky little friends uh, at the local movie theater. But I wasn't interested in it. Um, I was an avid reader. I was zero interest in sports. I collected rocks and bugs and stamps and coins and dreamt of going to foreign places and, um, you know, built model airplanes. This was too much for me to handle in that it it literally made me uh, question everything that I thought I knew. And that was not okay with me. One thing leading to another, Christina, I suppressed the memory and it lay dormant with the exception of one afternoon for a very particular reason um, for more than 14 years. It simply did not get rattled. It did not come up. But my sister never forgot it. We just never talked about it because she respected the fact from my behavior that afternoon that I was not comfortable with it. But when we did talk about it more than 14 years later, for the very first time, uh, both of our lives changed and mine very profoundly. Um, it derailed my career because something more compelling, um, more important had come into my life. And I have to say, I resented it. All I ever wanted to be was an artist, um, a painter and fully engaged. And now I couldn't be fully engaged. There was a certain amount of um, well, faking it to a degree. I mean, I still painted. I still taught my class at the School of Visual Arts in Manhattan, my alma mater. I still showed my work at galleries, but the art books started to uh, be dominated by UFO books. And here I am all these years later, much better known for my work in this field than my work in the arts. So from 2007 until 2010, you were a consultant to the city of Roswell, New Mexico, as their liaison to the then Governor Richardson's office on UFO related matters and coordinator of the city's annual UFO symposium. I can't imagine how exciting that must have been. Can you tell us what that entailed? Um, I, I can. Um, like anybody in this work, <clears throat> Roswell kind of loomed as a, a sort of Mecca, a place that you must visit at some point or another. But at a certain point, ego, arrogance, whatever you want to call it, got me into uh, thinking that, well, I'm not going to go there until they invite me to speak there. And so a number of extra years passed, I'm sure. And I was invited to speak there in, 2000, uh, in yeah, 2007, which was the 60th anniversary of Roswell. Um, I was very lucky to engage uh, positively with the people that were running it at that time, and they invited me to take this unique position. Um, at the time, the then mayor, um, who was a wonderful guy that I shared a vision with, which was this town, this small city, well, not so small, 50,000 or so people in the Southwest, had an opportunity to... Um, build a world themselves as a worldwide tourist destination built on education and entertainment you know there's a novelty to it and the name roswell is shockingly identifiable around the world and we started to work out this plan um 
I worked from home in New York State, but I worked. And wherever there was an issue, and usually it was ceremonial, um, where Governor Richardson, who was known to be very interested in this subject and did take it seriously until he was a, um, a contender for the presidency and um, reporters just kept harping on this subject to such a point where he, in a certain amount of disgust and denial, just dismissed it. Yeah, right. It's not a big deal. It's not probably. And, you know, tried to hold on to his political life. We're seeing that go away now. But um, in any case, I was back and forth between his office and my home and the mayor's office uh, and then involved in um, choosing speakers, uh, making sure that everything ran right. And it was a huge big deal. This was an event that was carried on for many years in a dual sense, a conference coming out of the International UFO Museum and Research Center, which did it independently of the cities. So it was kind of two festivals going on and we tried to work with respect for everything that they were doing and not complicated. Um, and then at a certain point, the mayor lost his job in uh, the come the next election and the next mayor was not interested and so when the mayor lost his job i lost my job oh my goodness that's insane peter we'll be right back after this break alternative talk you can trust the x Howdy, folks. This is Lou Elizondo, and you are listening to my very good friend, Christina Gomez, on Shifting the Paradigm. Hi, I'm Micah Hanks, and let me tell you something. I support Christina Gomez as a Patreon subscriber, and here's why you should, too. She brings all of her unique insights to a whole new generation and all while she's also going through college. Listen, support Christina, become a Patreon subscriber today. You won't regret it. Hey there, it's Christina. Did you know you can get access to an exclusive extra segment of additional questions and answers with all of my guests, as well as behind the scene videos and photos? Ever wonder how I turn my small college dorm apartment into a studio where I can shoot new videos or set up lighting and backdrops for my show or what camera I use? Yep, that video is there too, where I explain as I go along and also give the story of how I learned to do special video effects and editing. You can get access to all of that and much more by joining my Patreon supporters club. You'll be helping by supporting this channel, my research, and production costs, as well as investing in new shows coming soon. Starting from as little as $5 a month, there are several tiers you can choose from that suit your budget, and each tier carries extra perks and benefits. Join my Patreon club and become a supporter today. So you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on 24-7 with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Gold loves chaos uncertainty and disarray history shows us what gold does when people aren't sure aren't sure about the government the stock market their jobs or their retirement savings our national debt is skyrocketing gold and other precious metals are a defense measure against inflation and a stock market that might take years to recover so what can you do right now to protect yourself call united gold group we offer gold and other precious metals delivered securely within 72 hours are you worried about 
about the stock market, we can also help you set up a real gold or silver IRA or a 401k. Safe and secure, United Gold Group makes gold ownership affordable. Call now and get up to $2,500 in free gold or silver with a qualified IRA. Call 800-753-8534. That's 800-753-8534 or visit unitedgoldgroup.com. You're listening to the UNX Network, KUNX DB, Kansas City, Missouri. What is that? A deer? I can't tell. Is that a bear? Wait, is that a person? At night, your vision drastically changes. Imagine thermal imaging and the ability to see clearly up to 1,000 yards at night. That ability is a reality with AGM Global Vision, offering high-quality thermal and night vision optics. Get crisp and clear images that are Wi-Fi compatible, recordable, and storable. AGM Global Vision has an extensive range of quality-made rifle scopes, clip-on systems, spotting scopes, binoculars, goggles, lasers, and infrared illumination. Get the edge at night with crystal clear sight. Call 928-333-4300 or visit agmglobalvision.com. Use promo code TSL and get 10% off. That's agmglobalvision.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. And you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm. And we are back with Mr. Peter Robbins. Did you get any of the old timers in Roswell approaching you during that time with previously unheard of stories? Um, not, well, unheard for many of us. Um, two of my dearest friends and closest colleagues in the work are Don Schmidt and Tom Carey, who are two of um, the most respected and with good cause um, investigative writers on the subject. They've written a number of books together about Roswell. And basically the all, old timers are all gone at this point or very close to. But a dozen years ago or so, there were still quite a number of them around, many of them well in their 80s. But I did meet more than a few. And um, because of Don and Tom, I was able to sit down with them and hear them one-to-one -one tell me their stories and their memories about how and you know where they fit into the picture. It's also important to understand that not a single one of these individuals were looking for notoriety, wanted to write a book, were asking for money, um, wanted to be famous, or, um, you know, had any other ego-driven angle in this. They simply wanted to be on record with what they knew and remembered before they died, quite bluntly. And I would recommend any of Tom and Don's books to anybody who is a bit cavalier in their attitude about witness-driven testimony. Um, yes, there's certainly ways and, and proper reasons to not put a lot of weight on it in some situations. And in other situations, it is worthy of our great respect. Another example of that, to digress for a moment, was just this past October. In uh, October 19th in Washington, D.C., um, I had the privilege of attending a press conference at the National Press Club, which involved four former United States Air Force officers who were all involved in events during the height of the Cold War where UFO activity coming in over their base shut down the nuclear missiles that they were either in charge with or in one way or another working around. So often witness testimony is very much worthy of our respect. You are also an event coordinator for the Sci-Fi Channel's Alien Abduction Phenomena, a symposium. Now, for me, abduction cases are a murky field of research, and the vast majority of which are anecdotal in nature. How did you find yourself in that position, and what did it teach you in regards to the abduction phenomenon? I found myself in that position very specifically because when I first became involved in this work, it was an obsession 
based on my sisters sharing with me what I would now call um, archetypical abduction-related memories. But at that time, back in the later mid-1970s, I had never heard anything like this. I was not familiar with the phenomena. There was no real field of abduction research. The term gray was still many years away from entering into the culture. I didn't know there was such a thing as ufology or ufology, UFO conferences. And all I knew was that my sister wasn't a liar and that we were very close throughout her life. She passed in 2000 um, and that this was important and I needed to know more about it. And within a year, I had met another painter who was also becoming very involved in UFO studies, but in his case, an interest in the the individuals, the beings, the other intelligences beyond their hardware and the advanced technology that we recognized as UFOs per se. And his name was Bud Hopkins. And our acquaintanceship developed into a friendship, developed into a very close friendship. And for 35 years, we were friends. And for about half that time, I worked as his assistant. Some of your viewers and listeners may be familiar with his name because Bud, who passed about 10 years ago, went on to become the pioneer researcher into the scientific study of the abduction phenomena. And I had the privilege of working with, spending time with, and seeing a lot more than anecdotal evidence of this phenomena uh, over the years with Bud and the years since. Because of my deep involvement with him, I think primarily um, the then director of special projects for the Sci-Fi Channel, uh, a wonderful guy named Larry Landsman, who now is an independent producer, invited me to organize a symposium, but one specifically um, to draw attention to, to create a certain amount of buzz about a very soon to be released miniseries called Taken which uh, many of you, I would imagine, have seen or should see. Uh, at the time, it was the most expensive and the longest, I think 20 hours worth of programming um, miniseries in history, and it was the sci-fi channels. And um, what I basically did was work with the folks at sci-fi and create a very upscale evening at uh, the ballroom of the St. Regis Hotel in New York City with about... Um, gosh, 150 or so invited guests, everybody from society people to well-known writers to uh, all my friends to people who had had these experiences for an evening of drinks and uh, um, informal dinner, and then a series of talks by everybody from um, Bud Hopkins, Dr. John Mack of Harvard, Dr. David Jacobs of Temple University, two of the other ranking experts on this subject, to executives from um, the Sci-Fi Channel who told us about how when they acquired this property, executive produced by Steven Spielberg, you know, their mandate is a business, they're a corporation, it's to make money. They said, we now realize that this is real. It is really happening. And so we hope when you watch this, it will be to be entertained, but it is based on quite a lot of fact. And we showed clips from it and um, everybody had a grand time. And um, I only wish I had more work like that in um, uh, the freelance part of my life. And during this time, what cases seemed the most compelling to you when it came to abductions? Well, um, a number of them come to mind. Um, certainly one of the very best known is that of a Arizona-based uh, logger who still lives in Arizona named Travis Walton, who in 1975 was part of a logging crew, uh, guys that he grew up with in Snowflake, Arizona, um, who observed at very close range a fully articulated disc-shaped object hovering over a clearing where they had logs piled up and Travis impulsively bounded from their uh, pickup truck and 
stood under it, then realized quite immediately that he had made a mistake in judgment, um, but in trying to get back to the truck, was hit by a beam of light and thrown and knocked unconscious, and then missing for five days. And uh, the story is well known because of the Hollywood movie, which is partially accurate, called Fire in the Sky. He's a very good book uh, to that effect as well. And, um, you know, easy enough to find information about him. The story of a woman who went by the pseudonym of Kathy Davis, uh, a housewife in Indiana, which Bud Hopkins researched extensively and became um, a brilliant book in a case history called Intruders. Um, Kathy's real name, and I'm certainly not speaking out of school here, is Deb White Cabell. She has a wonderful uh, memoir out right now that you can find um, on Amazon. It's, um, I forget the name of it, but it's from August Night Press in London. If you go to their website, you will find the memoir. Uh, but her case <coughs> is remarkable in great part because of the evidentiary body that it's built on. It's certainly not just her word or her family or um, the same scarring on her leg in the same place as her mother's leg or people in the community remembering that night when all the lights went out and that UFO was there or the burn mark in the backyard where it sat or a whole list. Um, and for me, building a case, I don't get channeled messages from Martians. I have no contacts deep within the intelligence community. Uh, most of my, um, really all of my mentors told me to approach it the same way that law enforcement or um, the legal trade builds a case. Physical evidence, anecdotal evidence, historic evidence, documentary evidence, photographic, etc., and build it on as strong a foundation and obviously witness testimony where possible. Another case, and it's about as controversial as any, and a lot of people dismiss it as just too wild. If I hadn't worked that case week by week, month by month with Bud Hopkins for six years, I might be in the same place. That is the case of a, uh, a woman um, in New York who had lifelong experiences, but who was taken from her apartment literally floated through a 10th floor window into a craft at two in the morning and observed by many people. It's lower Manhattan. A lot of people were up uh, involving some well-known, um, a very well-known individual. And um, it was published as witness, the true story of the Brooklyn Bridge UFO abduction. Um, lesser known cases too, but one I would highly um uh, recommend is that of a wonderful guy in Michigan named William Konkoletsky. Uh, Bill is a college administrator, a family man who has had experiences along with his brothers his whole life and has written two terrific memoirs about them uh, with the third on the way. There are so many, quite honestly, Christina, that would just be a few off the top of my head. You were also a the writer, director, and producer of the documentary The Extraordinary Life and Mysterious Death of James Forrestal, a 2019 On Wings production. I had just talked about James Forrestal last week on Mysteries with a History, Lethal Encounters. It was my first time I came across the story and found it rather compelling. What stood out with you when it came to Mr. Forrestal? And what, in your opinion, from the evidence you gathered, was the most suspicious of his death? Um, I should say to start with, I don't know if I had any awareness of James Forrestal before 1987, when I attended uh, what was then a very significant conference, uh, annual symposium put on by the Mutual UFO Network, MUFON, the largest UFO organization in the world. It marked the 40th anniversary of our so-called modern age of UFOs, as well as um, uh, it was held in Washington, D.C. at American University. 
and um, the so-called MJ-12 briefing document for President-elect Eisenhower, which I find very compelling, although there are many documents alleged to be MJ-12 related that I'm not so certain about. But James Forrestal was named as one of 12 close advisors to President Truman on the then recent crash in New Mexico. And I became fascinated by the life that he had lived and the circumstances surrounding his death. His life reminded me of no one's more than uh, the literary creation of F. Scott Fitzgerald, J. Gadsby. He was a, um, a very driven young man who grew up in a small town in upstate New York, um, followed his dreams, made his bones, so to say, uh, at Dartmouth, at Princeton, um, on Wall Street, went on to become an advisor of President Roosevelt's during the Depression, a assistant secretary of Navy, secretary of Navy, and then became the first secretary of defense and arguably the second most powerful man in the world for that period of time. And then we are led to understand that due to all the pressure of all the work over the years, he suffered a profound nervous breakdown, which I am convinced that he did. And then tragically, uh, while institutionalized at Bethesda Naval Hospital in Maryland, threw himself from a window and was killed uh, in, as a suicide, which I am thoroughly convinced was not the case. Secretary uh, Forrestal was murdered. And I spent years, not linearly, but coming back, sometimes with breaks of several years, as information became digitized, uh, the internet became more powerful, I could access more documents and hospital records, and ended up doing um, a number of lectures and articles on him, and ultimately writing a script um, that lasted an hour, uh, and then using a teleprompter, word for word, reading the script, and then turning the project over to two very dear friends who I had worked with on the Travis Walton documentary, Travis, the true story of Travis Walton. Um, and it's available, although I have not completed the work of registering it with the Library of Congress. So it is not streaming anywhere, but it's available on DVD. But I haven't even touched your question which is what are some of the reasons I feel that he was murdered. Um, number one, um, having gotten hold of some of the hospital records, it is obvious to the people treating him that his condition was improving tremendously. Um, his brother had um, uh, arranged for him to finish his convalescence on the estate of a friend, and uh, the date was set that for May 22nd, Sunday, when he was going to be released, but hours before supposedly he suffered a massive stroke of depression, found his door unlocked, kicked out a screen uh, in an efficiency kitchen across the way, tied the sash of his bathrobe around his neck, then tied the other end around the radiator below the window lowered himself out the window to hang himself out a 16th floor window, changed his mind. Then the Navy established that there really wasn't a radiator there. There were fingernail marks on the jam outside the window. There was a broken glass on the floor of his room where he had lived for six weeks and was clean as a whistle. It looked like nobody had ever been there and on and on down the pantheon of absurd possibilities put forward. In my little documentary, I present the story of his life, the circumstances surrounding his death, and then using that little attorney that lives in all of our minds, present my conclusions. But I am convinced that he did certainly have a breakdown, in great part brought on by the stress of the secrets that he was not only carrying with him, but that he in no way was able to affect any sort of change around. Forrestal had a tragic character flaw. He tended to 
personalize all of his personal successes and failures as well as his professional ones. And it, I am convinced, ate him up inside that from the time that Truman installed him as our first Secretary of Defense till the day he stepped down about a year and a half later, he was not able to do anything about it and he saw his life as a complete failure. It's, it is like, again, a, um, a Horatio Alger, to use a very old analogy, um, American success story that descends into Greek tragedy. And for me, the ultimate reason for doing it is this was a very decent American who loved his country, who was a true patriot, who carried a great deal of the burden of helping us through World War II and the Depression and put his entire personal life aside, essentially gave his life for his country and then was written out of its history after a 21 gun salute, 5,000 people in attendance, uh, funeral at Arlington National Cemetery with President Truman reading the eulogy. How many of you have ever heard of James Forrestal? Unless you have a relative who served in the Navy and uh, there was a carrier called the Forrestal. There's a Forrestal campus at Princeton, a few other mm, namesakes, but a very important American name who was a casualty of the early days of the UFO cover-up. It is. And for someone with a title like himself, what do you think his job entailed? I mean, do, do you believe that he had a lot of government secrets or that he was maybe um, had kind of background information on the UFO topic? I mean, for his title, what do you think he was doing behind the scenes? Well, I, I know what he was doing to the degree that in creating um, the Defense Department, and I didn't even mention that, at the end of World War II, President Truman felt that our Department of War, a very honest title for a cabinet position, a Secretary of War, which we had always had from really the revolution right through to um, uh, the Truman administration, that it should be dismantled and a new entity created. And Truman didn't authorize a committee to do it. He authorized one man to do it, who he trusted that much. And James Forrestal, in fact, dismantled the old War Department, created the Department of Defense, and was made by acclamation. Not a single senator or congressman voted against him. Can you imagine that in today's world? That's how much this man was respected in America at that time and how much he warranted the position. But I know what his responsibilities were because one only needs to read the description of the responsibilities for the Secretary of Defense. He was the president's, basically um, his adjutant. He knew everything relative to matters of defense that the president knew. Everything the president of the United States knew from June of 1947 about the so-called flying disc unidentified aerial phenomena, flying saucer phenomena, James Forrestal knew. And when he was sworn in, in September of 1947, a scant two months plus or so uh, after Roswell, he came into the Pentagon with all of that material waiting for him on his desk. He knew everything about it. And he was the one who had to keep a straight face. He was the one that the president charged with to getting to the bottom of this, to finding some way of addressing it, which he was never able to do. Even with the most powerful military in the history of the world that we're aware of, he was able to make no progress. And that really tore him up inside. But he knew everything, Christina, that there was to know about it. And when he had his profound nervous breakdown, Again, a very different time, a very different um, uh, mindset in, in the public. Nervous breakdowns were for women. You know, real men didn't suffer them. This was the ultimate alpha male in a den of alpha males in the, um, the Beltway area of Washington, D.C. A competitive um, golfer, tennis player, a passionate amateur boxer, even until he was um, a cabinet level position. Um, he was charismatic like John Kennedy was. He was the man that 
every guy wanted to have a beer with and every woman wanted to sleep with. Fabulous dresser. My mother told me she had a crush on him in high school. I'm off topic a little bit, but I think that what happened was the men closest to Truman, nobody ever had a nervous breakdown, certainly that they knew about in that circle. And their concern was what happens if he spoke out of turn? What happens if he quote unquote recovered and then had a relapse? I feel, and I think I'm able to establish it to my satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt that he had to die and he knew it. And following that profound nervous breakdown publicly in March of 1949, I've documented several occasions over the next few days where he did try to take his life, even trying to throw himself from a moving car. Um, it's tragic. But then he started to respond to therapy and he wanted to live. And at that point, the job had to be finished. The rest you can learn from um, either reading any of my articles about it or uh, watching the documentary or, well, study on your own. Um, but he was an important American and he should be remembered and he should be honored. He should. And someone with a rather extensive background, and you're right, his death is rather mysterious because not only was he at some point, I guess, in a sense, depressed, was taking anxiety medication and um, suicidal, but later on after going through therapy, you're right, he was he was beginning to have this love for life and no longer yeah. wanted to die, but then ended up dying and yeah. it was proclaimed as being a suicide. Yeah. Peter, we'll be back after this break. You're listening to the UnX Network, KUNX DB, Kansas City, Missouri. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? UnX Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNX DB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. Howdy folks, this is Lou Elizondo and you are listening to my very good friend Christina Gomez on Shifting the Paradigm. Hi folks, these uncertain times can cause uncertain gut slowdown. Worry and fear can wreak havoc on our digestion, making it hard to feel optimum. Bloating, less energy, and occasional constipation can slow you down in your daily activity. Try Life Change Tea to get the tea.com. Life Change Tea can help get things moving so you can get that boost of energy you need. Life Change Tea helps protect and defend your health from intruders. It's a weird time right now with all the uncertainty, so gear up and defend your health. Where do you go to purchase? Log on to get the tea.com. That's get the tea, T E A dot com. The specials are on the front page, and we have numerous supplements to help combat intruders. It's time to take charge of our health. And to feel better in life, it's time to live. Again, GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Hi, hi. This is Race Hobbs, head of programming at the new UnX Network. And you're locked on Shifting the, the paradigm, paradigm with the intrepid Christina, Christina Gomez, Gomez on, on The X. The X. You ever notice your home doesn't smell as fresh as it used to? It's not you. As homes age, paint and carpet, they absorb all different kinds of odors, seemingly impossible to get rid of over time. But the Eden Pure Thunderstorm Air Purifier is guaranteed to eliminate those odors. The thunderstorm sends out the OH3 molecules into the air. It seeks out those nasty smells, germs and mold. 
and destroys them at the source. If you're like me, maybe you have a child who suffers from allergies or asthma. It can keep those so-called trigger smells away. No expensive filters to replace. Its compact size allows you to plug it into any room of the house and go. Other purifiers can cost up to $600 for one unit. You can get several thunderstorms for a fraction of that. With the discount code Matt, you'll save an additional 10 bucks. Go to EdenPureDeals.com. Enter the discount code Matt to save $10 off their lowest sale price. Again, go to EdenPureDeals.com. That's promo code Matt. You'll get free shipping. EdenPureDeals.com. Promo code Matt. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Are you thinking about purchasing a wood-fired heating or cooking appliance but don't know where to start? The new book, Wood-Fired Heating and Cooking, will guide you through the process and make the decision much easier. Find out about wood stoves, wood-burning fireplace inserts, masonry heaters, cook stoves, brick ovens, and more. Learn about operation and maintenance, buying and storing wood, even how to make your own charcoal. A bonus section includes delicious recipes for cooking in a wood-burning oven, grill, tandoori oven, or smoker. The wise homeowner, prepper, or homesteader will have the ability to heat their home with wood when the power goes out or to save money on increasing gas bills. Wood-Fired Heating and Cooking is available at Amazon. Visit www.woodfiredpub.com for more information. That's woodfiredpub.com. This is Micah Hanks of the Micah Hanks Program right here on KUNX. And right now, you're having your paradigm shifted by the one and only Christina Gomez. are back. When you were an editorial assistant on the United Nations Secretary General's report for the establishment of a UN UFO department, what were you looking for while while the establishment of the UN UFO department that ended up never launching after the meeting in 1978? I had Lee Spiegel on last week talking about his experience giving the meeting for having a UFO department for the UN. And it is so exciting to get another perspective on the same issue, but in a totally different department. So what were you looking for? Well, um, number one, Lee, who is one of my oldest friends in the work, um, we missed meeting each other back then when we were still in our 20s. And um, for me, this was my very first involvement in some real UFO related activity beyond writing an article. Um, I think I had one article published at that point. Um Lee, as you know, to recap very quickly, he was the man behind getting then um, um, Prime Minister Eric Gehry of the uh, Caribbean nation of Grenada to um, create this initiative to create a department within the United Nations to simply study the UFO question. Um, I became involved because my first mentor was a remarkable gentleman named Coleman von Kavetsky. Coleman lived in Queens, New York, where I was born. And at the time I was living in New York City's Chinatown and just getting started. And I read his name in a journal. He was in New York City and I went out to Queens and I met him. Coleman was probably already in his 70s. And he had been during World War II, a staff officer in the Hungarian Royal Army, uh, involved in um, overseeing all photo reconnaissance and photo analysis for the military. Um, He went on to become a a respected UFO um, researcher. And um, he was the one who introduced me to the United Nations connection. At the time, Coleman was a friendly acquaintance of the Secretary General, who was interested enough in the question of um, not in any ethereal way, but in serious ways, why UFOs should be considered 
as a matter of international security and awareness. And Coleman, who was um, really quite a visionary in this sense, wrote a long paper on how it was not out of the question that a genuine, truly anomalous UFO incursion into Soviet airspace might be understandably misinterpreted as perhaps thinking it was uh, enemy American uh, um, activity in their airspace and launch against that activity or even worse, launch nuclear missiles. By the same token, American military and intelligence might misinterpret Soviet um, activity in our airspace as a threat to our national security and have the same misunderstanding with the same tragic results. Coleman brought myself and my first contemporary colleague uh, in the work, a, a wonderful researcher um, named Antonio Huneus, uh, on as editorial assistants. The irony was, although he was wonderfully polite and very appreciative for all of our suggestions, and um, English being very much his second language, or third or fourth language, um, he his grammar was awful. <laughs> and he was also too proud, in a way, to accept our suggestions. So Antonio and I used to joke sometimes, sadly, that he wrote and spoke Comanese rather than English or Hungarian. And so these, the changes we suggested were not accepted, but the paper was. And at least it got me into those meetings, sitting up in the gallery of the General Assembly Special Political Committee, ironically, during a snowstorm that was so bad that it had closed the airports. Both of my parents played hooky from work, and the three of us went to the United Nations together, where we heard Alan Hynek and Jacques Vallée and Stanton Friedman and um, a, a very credible military UFO witness uh, named uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Lawrence Coyne. Um, astronaut um, Gordon Cooper was supposed to be there, but his flight from Texas was canceled. Ultimately, the, um, the resolution was passed. And remember, again, this was simply a resolution to establish a simple committee to study the subject of UFOs. Not surprisingly, the motion then was allowed slowly and without publicity to die in committee. So it never happened. But without Lee, there wouldn't have even been a shot at it. And without Lee, whose parents I may have been sitting next to up in the gallery that day, it took us another 10 years to meet when he was an NBC uh, uh, show host, uh, uh, NBC radio in New York, and have been fast friends ever since. But that was my involvement in that project. And like I said, last week I had Lee on the show and he spoke about the 33rd chapter of the U.S. Air Force Cadet Manual that was given to members at a key United Nations meeting. Did you get a look at that? And what were your thoughts if you did? I didn't. That was um, what we got was a series of press releases up in the gallery. Again, um, Lee and I may have passed each other in the hallway but I didn't know him from Adam back then, and I was never able to see that. Uh, you know, he told me probably the same thing he talked to you guys about uh, on the show last week, but that was something I never got to actually see. Um, even in present day, have you looked at the chapter? I'm sure I have, but not for long enough that I, I remember it. On, on a total side note, you have been an assistant director for countless theater plays. Do you think the path that Disclosure is taking, in a sense, is playing out like a theater play? And if so, why? I, I do, in a way. Um, history, as they say, is written by the winners. Um, in that sense, the world that we perceive, that we study from the time we're young, that we call reality, the past, has been stage managed. Um, working in the theater, one gets a deeper appreciation uh, of that fact. In June, as you know, and many of you viewers know, um, history was made by the Pentagon's release of a report on the UFO UAP question. 
Um, it was redacted, which is the version that we civilians saw. The full version went to members of Congress, presidential cabinet, key people in the Pentagon, I'm sure the military industrial complex, key players around the world. But what they were saying was a variation on what they were saying 75 years ago. It could be the Russians, well, or the Chinese, wouldn't have been them 75 years ago. It could be us in another office, you know, higher up where we're not cleared to know that we're working with super advanced technology, or who knows, it's even possible, but very unlikely that it could be Martians, as they would have said back then, or, you know, other intelligences from parts unknown. We, not you and I, Christina, but we, the government, the secret keepers, people highly placed in the intelligence community, they know what's going on as well as we do, or better, I would venture. And yet they still feel compelled to hold back. Part of the reason may simply be the embarrassment of admitting that we've been lying to um, our people and the world at large for three quarters of a century at least. That's awkward. But then in back of that is a fear of mass panic, which 75 years ago held a lot of weight. Now, maybe not so much. But one thing we can be sure of is if they, the secret keepers within our government, have their way, disclosure will come in about a thousand years. Um, they will keep issuing reports, um, maybe several a year for the indefinite future, if they have their way, uh, each one seeming to put forward a little bit more knowledge of what we have learned when we knew it decades ago. But they can't just come clean. Again, we've been lying for too long and too outrageously. In, in one sense, if the President of the United States had the power and the mandate to do it, on his or her own. And I think those days are gone now, it would have to be orchestrated with other world leaders, leaders in the world of science and psychology and theology and finance and business. This would be a major, it would be the ultimate paradigm shift. Um, but hypothetically, if a president could go on media and say, my fellow Americans and by extension, citizens of the world, it is my solemn duty to um, inform you that blah, blah, blah. They couldn't do it because for starters, that club of presidents, ex-presidents, or the families of former presidents is very elite and quite powerful. And it doesn't matter whether they were on the left or the right. It doesn't matter that whether they were Republicans, Democrats, um, liberals, or libertarians, it would mean that every single president, since and including Harry S. Truman, has been lying and being an unindicted co-conspirator in the biggest cover-up in the history of humanity, bar none. And they're a tad sensitive about that, as I'm sure any of you viewers can appreciate. That said, I would like to think that disclosure will come by some uh, logical process. I think what you do, Christina, what I try to do in bringing forth credible information to a wider and wider audience, encouraging them to think for themselves and do their own research and evaluation is part of that process. And that part of the process is very healthy. It's happening all over the world without people like Stephen Greer in Washington, our lobbyist against UFO secrecy, and one of the most dedicated people I've ever met in my life. Um, there is this healthy drive, and every day there are new people that come on board, but it's happening arithmetically, not ge geometrically. The number is not doubling. It's, you know, five, seven, nine rather than two, four, eight, and on and on. Um, it's incumbent on us and on our friends and on our colleagues and on you who are watching and listening. If you begin to take this as seriously as Christina and I do, to begin to learn more about it and share that knowledge and information with your friends and family. 
And ultimately, if nothing else happens to change that, we will reach a, um, a critical mass, so to say, a tipping point within populations where this information won't destabilize the fabric of society when it comes out. The other wild card is a WikiLeaks type dump of information um, or um, dating myself here, the Pentagon Papers and Daniel Ellsberg um, showing information about the lies the American government perpetrated on the people relative to the war in Vietnam that somehow would be undeniable. Um, or they, some of these other intelligences, because I'm sure there are quite a number of them, and with their own relationships and uh, histories with aspects of humanity, that they may simply decide to reveal themselves en masse rather than regularly, every day to individuals as they do since time immemorial, probably. And I, I agree with you. I do not think that disclosure will be coming from the government, but instead it will be coming from ourselves or if the others end up showing themselves in, in, a, in a wide sense. So that leads me to the question, what do you think about the Galileo project? Would you, um, uh, for the purpose of um, our audience, give us some bullet points on that for starters. Well, the Galileo Project is run by Harvard professor Avi Loeb, and from my understanding of it is he is practically, as an astronomer, collecting data what is seen in space and hopefully giving it out to the public. Now, he seems to be one of the first scientists, at least publicly, to go ahead and push for this kind of disclosure, less to the extent of experiencers and anecdotal accounts, but more into the actual data that can be collected, that we are simply not alone in the universe. Very good. And thank you for doing that. Um, Loeb, for me, is um, a wonderful example of not just a new an aspect of a new generation of the scientific community, but also academia, because he is a Harvard professor of astronomy, as well as being a highly respected astronomer. Um, I, like most of us, once his name started to come up in the work, was fascinated that there was yet again somebody associated not just with a major respected top 10 university in the United States, but somebody with unquestionably sterling classic uh, credentials in the scientific and astronomical community. And um, I guess it's now uh, six weeks or two months ago, I took part in an interview with, with Professor Loeb, and he's tough and he is on the case. Number one, I think that since late 2017, as we have observed, the ridicule factor associated with taking this subject seriously continues to diminish. And that's a very healthy thing. Uh, if it had been five years ago, Professor Loeb might not wanted to have gotten into this work because the potential for deriding him, for attacking him, for belittling him, for taking such a nonsensical subject seriously could seriously hurt or destroy the career of any academic or scientist. I think what he's doing is wonderful. And although he has absolutely no interest in pursuing an investigation into any of the more exotic aspects of the subject right now, like UFO-related abduction, which is as real as the chairs that we are sitting in, Christina. Uh, I only respect that and understand that. This man is a pioneer on a certain level, following in the path of a handful of academics and scientists who are publicly putting themselves on the mark and in doing so, making this area of study more accessible, uh, more friendly, and more, um, how can I say, challenging in the best sense of the word for uh, a, a science professor or a scientist to want to get involved in. So I have nothing, I, I think the Galileo Project is first rate. I think in terms of what we in the UFO UAP research community feel we know and understand about the sweep uh, and the breadth of this subject, it's entry-level stuff. 
but it's the most important entry level stuff because it clears the ground for other people in official science, so to say, or mainstream academia to take the same steps and bring this subject into much wider serious recognition. Given all of your experience and history with this topic, taking into the account the exposure in 2021 and the new UFO office, do you have any predictions or insights into what we may see occurring during 2022? Absolutely not. I have no idea in hell what we're going to be seeing in 2022. And I'm just as curious as anybody is. Um, the twists and turns in this work, especially the subtle ones behind the scenes, you just don't know what's coming at us. I think we're in a fairly healthy place, ironically, in this unhealthy moment <laughs> in human history. Uh, and even with all of the strictures and um, frustrations that accompany us going into a third pandemic year, um, our area of study is alive and more important on a certain level, or at least as important, is Congress, the Senate, the House, uh, key people within government around the world, key people in military and intelligence are starting to take this subject more and more seriously or feeling more comfortable expressing how seriously they have always taken it, but not felt able to express. Um, and, you know, there's a old saying that politics makes strange bedfellows. Well, so does this phenomena. And I think if you're looking for examples, uh, you need look no further than uh, Marco Rubio, Rubio uh, senator from Florida, a hard right winger whose politics I do not agree with and whose attitude toward uh, wanting to know more about what's really going on with this subject, I couldn't be more supportive of. And on the progressive realm, um, one of my senators, Senator Christian Gillibrand of um, New York State, whose recent proposal um, is absolutely breathtaking in terms of detail, knowledge, background, suggesting to me that she had some very high level advice because this was beyond even uh, average senators level. Um, we see the same thing in terms of mass media. Um, on the right, um, on Fox News, we see Tucker Carlson, um, who is absolutely rabidly serious about this subject. On the left, not so much a named individual, but the left equivalent, whether it's CNBC or CNN, um, the same serious, respectful talk about this phenomena. And I think that's a very healthy thing. So as far as specifics coming at us next year, I don't know. And um, I look forward to finding out the same as anybody else. And since the pilot UAP footage came out with the 2017 New York Times article, the Tic Tac, the Gimbal, and the Go Fast, these don't seem to be UFOs with the classical shape and features, right? I mean, in my opinion, to... To what else has been seen over the years, over land, for example, as in flying saucers, triangular craft, elongated disks, and long cylinder-shaped objects? Have you come to an opinion or a conclusion about what is being seen over and tracked under the oceans? That's a great question. That was one that I first started to look at in the 1980s. Um, the work of a New Zealand ufologist who hardly gets any recognition um, these days, Bruce Cathy, C-A-T-H-I-E, who specialized in looking at this subject as well as the late great Ivan T. Sanderson, who began his career as a, um, a, a biologist specializing in large uh, mammals, wrote about you know, um, wild um, life in Africa in the later 1930s and moved into the field of, of UFOs. Um, he wrote a wonderful book called Invisible Residence, published in the 60s, I think. I'm sure you can find used copies online for very little money. Um, I think we're dealing 
in many cases with the same unknown phenomena. And when I started to think about it and think, you know, these craft, as some of them, some most certainly are, if they can traverse these distances in space and put up with the harsh conditions, harsh being an understatement, that they would have to encounter, even if they're smaller craft coming out of motherships in the Earth's atmosphere, what have you, that surely they're waterproof <laughs> and can zip along at appreciable speed through water as well as through the atmosphere or through lack of atmosphere. Um, when I first started reading the stats of some of these underwater unknowns and the thing's going 80 miles an hour. Now, 80 miles an hour, most of us have traveled at speeds appreciable or beyond that in automobiles and other land vehicles. But going 80 miles an hour underwater is insane. That's, you know, the resistance, you know, you shoot a bullet underwater and it stops in a very short period of time because it can't maintain, you know, that velocity. So I think in some cases we are dealing with very similar phenomena. And when one gets into the hyper-specific study of such phenomena, you can go back hundreds of years in the annals of um, the uh, logs of sailing ships who encountered phenomena that will only compare to underwater unidentified phenomena that the Navy has tracked in so-called modern times. It is a parallel mystery, but I think may have some of the same solutions involved. Peter, thank you so much. We've come to the end of the show. It went by so fast and we will definitely have to do this again soon. I look forward to it, Christina. Thank you. You're listening to the UNX Network. KUNX DB, Kansas City, Missouri. I'm so thankful that Peter has shared his knowledge and experience with us. It's a real honor. And that's it once again for another show. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this episode. Thank you for joining me tonight, and thanks to my Patreons. Jimmy Church with Fade to Black is coming up next on KUNX Talk Radio, the UNX Network. So stay tuned. I'll see you soon. And remember, keep your eyes on the skies. Thank you.